Hello, my name is Ben. My name's Andrew. And we are your hosts of the Two Vague Podcast this week. One word, two hosts, stories, trivia, and video games. Andrew, welcome back. Uh, it's good to be back. It's nice to have you back. So we can kind of advance the narrative of the show. Let's advance the narrative. I mean, yeah. What's going on recently with you? Is there anything exciting going on? You're done with your Kickstarter and that's all fully funded, right? That, the Kickstarter's funded. Yeah, yeah. By, by the time anyone hears this, it'll be all over. So I got to the first stretch goal, which means I'm printing it in color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fun. I, the more I thought about it, the more I wanted to do it. So I was going to do it anyway. And then the it reached. It was like I manifested the stretch goal being reached, I guess. There's a second stretch goal. We're like, we're $35 short of it. And that would be adding a sticker in with it. Yeah. Yeah, which that's kind of neat, but I'll just make a sticker some other time. Yeah, I mean, I could just go ahead and say, oh, I want to do a sticker anyway and, and throw it in there. But I've got like a million other projects to do just to try to stay focused. I'm trying not to get so distracted because the big thing in my life is the little baby girl that lives in my house now. Right. And she's super awesome. Well, it's too bad you didn't reach that third goal. Oh, oh, the 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 sporky. No, I was thinking uh, of the mukbang video that you're going to do. Oh, <laughs> mukbang. You know, with all those fried toothpicks that we talked about last week. Oh, yeah, the fried toothpicks. Yeah, that's a varied bonus episode that <laughs> you have to be a Patreon backer. To... No, no, it was a, just a text message conversation. But yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah, South Korea says, hey, stop eating fried toothpicks. One step above Tide Pods, at least this stuff is mostly edible. They're not like wood toothpicks. They're special Korean, you know, food starch. Yeah, they're made compressed of... Compressed food starch, yeah. yeah. I think potato and, and sweet potato starch is what I read. Yeah, so, I mean, if you deep fry that, it probably makes something really, really tasty. Deep fried starch, come on. <laughs> I mean, that, isn't that what those little puffy vegetable crisp things are? Is that... Yeah, or oh, the veggie straws and, yeah. The fact that it comes from that is not the issue. You put them in your mouth, so at least the outside has to be sanitary, right? Yeah. But that doesn't say anything about the rest of the thing and what it's made up of and how it, I mean, you know. Yeah, there, there could be another ingredient, some kind of binder that you really don't want to be eating. Exactly. A binding agent, yeah. Right. I've never eaten a binder. Well, not a trapper keeper or nothing. Do they still exist, trapper keepers? Every once in a while, I think I see a trapper keeper and I go, whoa. But then you realize it's a school supply mirage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's like, uh, where are my dittos? Where am, uh, mimeograph, where are those things? That's what you're up to having wonderful daughter and or uh, Kickstarter funding and creating. The Kickstarter went, yep. They just came out with a new DLC for Cult of the Lamb. Sounds it is, like a weird church. Yeah, it kind of is. It is a, a game developed by Massive Monster and published by Devolver Digital that came out in 2022, August. When I say roguelike, do you know what I'm talking about? I know there's a genre called roguelike and you've talked to me about it before and I've even read a definition of it. It's like a game called Rogue. Yes, exactly. Right. That's what Rogue... And it, it's the dumb... I mean... <laughs> <laughs> there, there's got to be a better description than just calling it. Well, like Rogue is one of those like early games that sort of defined a genre, right? Which is why they're called roguelike. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, mostly it's like procedurally generated stuff. And once you die, you start over again. But I mean, those are just part of the game mechanics. I don't think that you need to know that it's like Rogue. The same thing with Metroidvania, like they combine Metroid and Castlevania and call those things Metroidvania when they're 2D side-scrolling. I want to know if there are any Oregon Trail-like uh, genre. No. I only needed one of those. Infocom-like. Do you remember Infocom games? Infocom, yeah. They were basically like narrative games, right? Exactly. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Hitch yeah, and... Douglas Adams like actually wrote the game. Like yeah, That was, I think, his favorite version of the Hitchhiker's Guide. Oh, yeah, I think you mentioned that before. He just really liked that format because I think that that's kind of the way he would think. He'd be like, oh, the story could go off in this direction and do this. And then he'd be like, or it would go off on that. You know, I think he had trouble getting to the end of a script because 
he kept wanting to go on different tangents. So the text-based game was like the perfect format to actually explore all those narrative avenues. Exactly. We haven't even got to the definition and well, we're... We've already tied it in. Nailed we're it. We're connecting video games and the narrative. Jeez. Infocom-like is not a thing, though. But anyway, this roguelike, Cult of the Lamb, centers around a protagonist, which is a lamb who is essentially sacrificed by a cult. Then when you're going down to the underworld or whatever, some sort of evil thing says, I want these four rival religion or whatever. I want to kill them. So you're going to be, you know, you got to start a cult in my name, convert people over to the cult. The roguelike piece is little dungeons that you have to go in to Mm -hmm. find resources, to fight enemies, the other part is you got to keep your cult happy. So you've got to you balance. Gotta keep your cult happy. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You've got a pulpit where you preach. You can do rituals such as a feasting ritual, depending on how mm-hmm. you develop. I mean, there is a little bit of branching with the types of things you can select. Yeah. One of the ones that I really like, you can sacrifice your followers too. Yeah. Does that, that keep them happy? Well, it depends on which follower. Wayne is really bumming everybody out. Time for so the sacrifice. sacrifice. <laughs> like it's one of those long term, short term things. And there are also that can be heretics. So when I start seeing someone who's becoming a heretic, that's when the the strategic sacrifice. Right? Exactly. <laughs> It brings the overall level of the cult down a little as far as their mood, but in the long term, it's a, a it's always a good thing. And it's just kind of like those farming games where you create crops and you do. Oh yeah. It's essentially you're balancing all the resource things of that. In addition to generating following and faith and all sorts of things that you use to build and grow your cult as you are exploring these dungeons and defeating these evil monster things. So it's a fun game. Anyway, I've been playing that again because it just came out with the downloadable content, the naughty downloadable content. It's called Sins of the Flesh. It's not really, it's, you know, they make it all cutesy because it is a cutesy looking game, but it's definitely not for kids. It's one of those ones where there's the contrast between it being cutesy looking, but it's really the subject matter is not cutesy at all. Like Leisure Suit Larry. That was so long ago. That was so long ago. Like 40 years ago. Yeah. (laughs) They didn't call that a graphic Infocom like, but it was. No. That's what I've been playing, uh, getting back into the Cult of the Lamb, started over with a brand new cult, which I've called Cult of the Vague. Cult of the Vague. (laughs) That's what I've been up to. Can we we get back to fried vegetable starch? Oh yeah, let's get back to fried vegetable starch. That's a better idea, because... (laughs) I think (laughs) we got one last can of Japanese Pringles translated Kanda Curry Grand Prix Museum. The Google Translate, it gives me all kinds of different things because of the curvature of the can or something. But sometimes it would say like famous restaurant curry, like which it must be connected to some kind of restaurant. My understanding is that there's a curry festival that occurs in Japan. A curry festival. Oh, yeah. I think there's something. Yeah. So I believe the curry festival is why this Pringles flavor was created. Yeah, that makes sense. I like on the translation, like on the bottom line, one of the the words sometimes translates as commitment. (laughs) Commitment spices or just the whole thing? Commitment commitment. spices. Yeah. No, no. One part of it's commitment and the rest of it, like one time I tried to do a screenshot of the the google translate but it didn't work but it said commitment spar it was like (laughs) commitment spar that sounds terrible okay (laughs) that is a mistranslation right you know we've been two for two on the japanese pringles before like there have been revelations to me of of what a snack food can be like right so let's officially start this segment which is andrew's sensory adventures in japan the Curry Festival, Japanese Pringles. The Kanda Curry Grand Prix Museum. The Grand Prix Museum. <laughs> yes, that's my favorite translation. So Yes. Here we go. Okay. Okay, come on, lid. Ooh, that was a good pop. Yeah, okay. These, I've seen a little more wear and tear than the other two cans, but I'm not complaining. Yeah. It's, it's all in the, the flavor profile, but... Again, these are these are dainty little Pringles compared to American Pringles. They're small, but mm-hmm. they probably have big flavor. 
That's not a thing you want to use around an American person saying the Pringles are dainty. <laughs> you don't want to say dainty Pringles. I don't, no. I don't think Japan cares. I don't know. But... Dainty Pringles might go well with that internet phenomenon that was going around a couple of months ago. Girl dinner. The dainty Pringles, they're perfect for a girl dinner. Um, so, now, <laughs> is that, can you say that kind of stuff these days? I mean... What? Girl dinner? Or is girl dinner a thing that I don't understand? Girl dinner is a thing that they were talking about on the internet. These Instagrammers showing pictures of... They're making meals out of like tiny little foods. Or little like snack things. And like, this is girl dinner. So, huh. yeah, that's... Uh, it it might be done now. Maybe it was just a moment and it's gone, but yeah, that's that's strange. I don't think size should be a determination of whether the meal is girl or boy, but you know, Oh yeah, it's, it was, we'll just say the whole hashtag was problematic. I'm only referencing it in the spirit of satire. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say these, these are good curry potato chips. Like I'm, I'm going to eat the whole can. Did you smell it? Does it smell curry? I mean, is it? Oh, yeah, I, it smells like, yeah, it smells like curry, tastes like curry. Does it overpower the potato at all? Is it, is it just no, enough curry it's, or? It's just enough curry. It's like the right balance. Like they just nailed it. So if we've learned anything about these three Pringles cans, they know how to do it. Japan. I would say um, in Japan, they, they know their, their crispy treats. Maybe an interesting experiment would be buy one of the flavors that is essentially an American flavor, like let's say sour cream and onion. Mm-hmm. Buy one of those and compare the two and see where it differs or see which one's better. I mean, that's because these are these are all flavors that aren't available in the United States. I don't see the curry flavor at my Safeway. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Go to your spice aisle. Maybe you could just sprinkle some curry on a chip. That was my concern is like, is it just curry mm-hmm. or is it some sort of mixture of curry and other spices? It's like this really nice umami flavor. Well, I think curry is a mixture of spices. Okay. Would you get the same flavor? Do you think if you put a, a plain Pringles and just sprinkled some curry on it or is there something oh, more to it? Sprinkle some American curry powder on it. Yeah. Um, I think this is a, a distinctive proprietary blend of herbs and spices. Okay. Okay. I I don't know. I think um, <laughs> just like the Colonel. Just like the Colonel. I think Colonel Sanders was called up and no. Um. Hmm. Ooh. Do you think they have KFC Pringles somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if just fried chicken Pringles would be good or chicken and waffles Pringles. Chicken and waffles Pringles. Mm. That might just be too many flavors. I mean, fried chicken and waffles, like, you you, you know, it's like, do you put eh. maple in there? Eh, you know. Yeah, I know. No, that would sell. I think from a marketing standpoint, they could do chicken and waffles, and it wouldn't really have to taste that great. Yeah. I bet they would sell some. Mm. I mean, I'm saying because I had this suspicious stew, so. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the sucker that bought the suspicious stew, and blah, blah, yeah. Oh, but you know what I did? I did find at the the local Safeway the other day. Yeah, the American uh, Scorching Medium. Oh, okay. Have you tried those? No, they're sitting back there waiting for the right time. But, yeah, yeah. I was really unimpressed. I tried those Scorching Medium barbecue ones. Yeah, and I don't think it had to do with because I put them down and I picked them up later. I don't think the spice was distributed evenly across the chips. No. Some of them were freaky hot and others were not. And it's just kind of like... Some were more medium than others. (laughs) Yes. Some of them were definitely not medium. Some of them were were less than medium and some were more than medium. Less than medium. (laughs) It's a new Brad Easton Ellis novel, Less Than Medium. (laughs) (laughs) That's a deep cut. It is a deep cut. I mean, I think the most notable Brad Easton Ellis that everyone these days recognizes is probably American Psycho. Right. Okay, so uh, where do we put this on the scale, Andrew? And by we, I mean you. Boy, the addictive garlic, like I I thought that was the best Pringle I ever had. But I also really liked the... uh, Scallops? (laughs) Scallops, yeah. I was like, yeah, that was... So so I'm going to put this, the curry... um, between a little bit above the scallops and really close to the addictive garlic. Just not quite as addictive, but really 
nice solid just balancing the curry and and the potato yeah and hate to break it to you american pringles man you gotta break out your a game for your next flavor yeah i mean, I mean it's you can rest yeah. on your laurels with uh with your sour cream and onion and uh sour cream and onion and that's those are fine but that's interesting. Maybe special edition Pringles that aren't sold at Walmart. Maybe like a... Um, oh boy, the hot honey was terrible. Yeah, I threw that one away. It was... <laughs> that was a DNF. Did not finish. D- DNF. <laughs> Pringles special edition, the, the sharper image. Whoa. Do people know what the sharper image is now? Or is that just something that died with malls? I remember the sharper image, right? Yeah. yeah. They would send you a catalog every once in a while that had all the... All the fancy stuff. It was kind of like the Sky Mall, but at an actual mall. <laughs> right. <laughs> sort of a high class Spencer's Gifts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Less of the porn stuff and more of the, uh, well, I, I don't mean porn, but you know what I mean. Like, I know what you the mean. The lowbrow stuff. The the novelty gift cards and the... Yeah. And the boobs stress ball and yeah, it's just like all the... The basic like bachelor party favors. And... Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Okay, so let us get into narrative now that we narrative. have... Now that we've concluded this chapter in the narrative of the Pringles. Yes, but. exactly. <laughs> More to come. More to come. The story continues. The story continues. But first, the definition. And we'll go back to the old reliable Oxford, a noun, a spoken or written account of connected events, semicolon, a story. It's got bullets underneath it, essentially. The narrated part or parts of a literary work as distinct from dialogue, the practice or art of telling stories, a representation of a particular situation or process, such as a way as to reflect or conform to an overreaching set of aims or values. So those are the nouns, the adjective, in the form of or concerned with narration. Okay, so it's kind of a little narrative poem, yeah. The origin we have here, late Middle English as an adjective from French, narratif. Na- narratif or narrative. I'm, I don't speak French. N- narratif. Narratif. Oui. Oui. Je parle un peu de français. <laughs> yeah, I took four semesters. You have some French. I can pronounce some French stuff. Okay, and uh, from late Latin... Narrativius, narrativus, Nar- narrativus, or narrativus, yeah. telling a story. Is it narrativus or narrativus? That's such a good question. I don't. We'd have to ask a living Latin speaker. Okay. But okay. Which, no, it's a dead uh, language. Of, I don't know. Of which there are none. <laughs> well, I mean, there are people who speak Latin, but they're right, right, but not a native Latin speaker. There are no more native Latin speakers. So, and then also from the verb. Narrare. 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 So basically the, the little diagram goes from Narare, late Latin, to Narratifus, also late Latin, to French, which is narratif, and then English narrate to form narrative. The English would be narrative from narrative. Right, yeah. The English shows as narrate. What? I'm like, if I'm following the word orange, and well. Okay. Oh, that's what I'm, I'm looking, looking at, at too. Different. Oh, you're looking at I'm a different say, one? I'm saying late Middle English is adjective from French narrative. Okay. From, yeah. This has got a little split thing where it's French that says narrative, and then below it says narrate, and then together they go to narrative, narrative, late Middle English. The IVE is an adjectival, or the IF is adjectival ending in, in French. Yeah. So, the English is the language that turns adjectives into nouns. We turn everything into nouns, and then we turn every noun into a verb, and then... Yes, we go nonifications, then, verbifications. That's what we do. And then we can turn anything back into an adverb by putting an L-Y at the end. It's pretty great. Pretty flexible. We don't have to worry about um, any, uh, you know, the, the tricky stuff, the gender agreement or number agreement mm. or, or declension I don't have to decline the nouns. We oh, don't have any thought, of that. I'm sorry. Did you say dick clenching? 
No, declension. <laughs> like you, you can you. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I sorry. De- derailed your train of thought there. Declension. D e c l e n s i o n. Nouns have different cases. Uh-huh. Like in English, we we pretty much just have you know nominative and possessive. Right. And we just mark possessive with the little apostrophe s other languages there are more cases for nouns and i like german has a few cases and then i think latin might have had at least like six so it's just Mm. now i never studied latin i just heard people talk about latin and that's how i know that latin nouns decline okay okay so that's yeah, why, so that's, that's why they call talking. it declension yeah so that's what i'm talking about so it's like conjugation for verbs but it's declension so like but hey here's the thing that my google is showing me what is your google showing you it's showing me that narrative is worth uh, 12 points in scrabble oh well there you go doesn't that depend on where you put it on the, you just mean the base score is that right? the base score yeah i'm not saying like if you got a triple word score or you know double letter score you know sorry for my ignorance i i just the first thing i thought of was like how do you tell because you get a score oh yeah okay no this sense. is the base score of just the straight letters which yeah. maybe this is a yahoo it's not a google i don't know why my freaking google chrome set yahoo as the default search engine. I don't understand. Well, at least it wasn't Ask Jeeves. Jeeves needs to rest. There was a brief period of time when Ask Jeeves turned into ask.com, but I don't, I don't oh, even know right. if, they, if they exist anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Yahoo, it gave me the same definition you did. So it pulled that definition from, I think it's powered by Oxford languages. So that's... Okay, so yeah, same with Google. So yeah, so I pulled that. So then... They probably gave me an edited version of the etymology, mm. like a simplified version, which is gotcha. why that. Gotcha. But then, then at the bottom, it shows me Scrabble points <laughs> like with the little Scrabble tiles. Which is where the Google Ngram viewer is in the Google universe. It's probably, you yeah. know, it's like, we got to put something that Scrabble. People love Scrabble. Let's put that there. Some people do. Some people just have that stuff memorized. It's like why some people do you... are super wicked at cra- Scrabble. Like yeah. they're just uh, I. That's okay. I enjoy Scrabble. I will get waxed by my in laws. But waxed is probably a high score in uh, Scrabble word, though, right? The W that's, and the X. But... Yeah, definitely higher than the narrative. Okay, so last time on Andrew's adventure with. The Instagram bandits, the Instagram, the Instagram, the Instagram book reviewer, uh, spammers. Uh, I, okay. Yeah. Right. That was the weird side effect of my Kickstarter is that a bunch of people were started approaching me on Instagram to sell reviews of my book. Just Instagram or do they do it on other platforms as well? Cause I know you're on, I don't get, TikTok I don't get probably. a lot of messages on TikTok. Okay. But, and like, they're not posting these reviews on TikTok. They're. Just doing it. They're barely reviews. They're not posting anything. They're getting an AI to generate a whole lot of stuff that looks like they do reviews. Mm. And if you go and read them, they're like very, very milk toast, five paragraph essay format. This is junk. And you're like, oh yeah, nobody's doing this over and over again. And you look at the posting dates on their reviews they put on Instagram, and they're like doing seven on one day. And it's like, you're not really doing anything. But this one, the last one was really special because, you know, I was like, oh, well, what's your company's website? And they actually gave me a website to a company. But then they said, but we do all the interactions through the Instagram. I was like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this one was interesting because one of their packages there would get me a review in the New York Times. And I was like, for only $599, I can buy a review in the New York Times. And I was like, wow, you guys can do that. And then he sent me a couple of links to a couple book reviews that showed up in the New York Times. Uh huh. They're like, oh, yeah, we did this and this. And, uh, and one of them was written by the author, Chris Bajolian, who, you know, way back, he, he had a book that was in Oprah's book club. Uh huh. Nobody that's being reviewed and the New York Times is hitting up someone on Instagram for trying to get more clicks. Right. But so there was a lie, but I was like, oh, how, what's it like to work with him? And he gave me some, oh, you know, he's like that. <laughs> 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 like, uh-huh. 
But that, then, you know, I just ignore him. Then be like, oh, so are you interested? What package? And it's like, oh, I'm totally interested in the New York Times package. And, you know, I'm like trying to tell him like how to do a contract. How, how are we going to do the contract? And he's like, oh, well, you know, we just do it through the, the message. Like, oh, no, I was trying to get them to give me a mailing address. Oh, OK. And, like, yeah. and I was like, can you do, like mail me the contract? And then I was like, oh, I don't know how we can do a sign a contract if we don't have a physical thing. It's like, oh, oh, no, we can. It's like, oh, you mean like DocuSign? And they're like, oh, yeah, DocuSign. I was like, OK, so when you come up with the contract, can we do um, it's, uh, 210 net 30 on delivery? <laughs> <laughs> It's like, what, is, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, well, it means once the product is delivered to me, I have 10 days to pay at a 2% discount, or I can pay the full thing in 30 days. And they're like, oh, no, 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 you have to pay up front. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> you just did that to, to F with them, didn't you? I, I, I sure did. Yeah. He hasn't yeah. gotten back to me since then. So, mm. yeah, I was like, I. Oh, I'm sure your accounts receivable department can tell you how that works. <laughs> oh, oh no, you don't do it like that. Oh, oh you don't. See if they can get uh, your book review on Truth Social. See if they can do that for <laughs> you. It's like, I'll buy it if you can get my review on Truth Social. Yeah. There is a certain point where those people will reach a, I mean, like they know that you're messing with them, right? Do, do you I just, hope that was the point. I I hope they know that I'm messing with them. I don't think they do if they continue if they're continuing to try and sell you on it. I mean, yeah, no, just, he hasn't tried just, to sell me anything. I, he liked some of my posts since then, but <laughs> hasn't messaged me in a few days. Well, okay. I mean, he wants to keep that appearance up just in case you you know. Yeah, I know. Like, remember me? You were thinking about giving me six hundred dollars. Yes. How do you account for the state sales tax for uh, services rendered? Mm. I mean, that <laughs> Patreon had some issues where if you're providing a service or things that it is that is an added value, they have to mm-hmm. charge tax for it. Yeah, there's... Oh, boy. You know what? Let's not get into the taxes. That's not very good for advancing the narrative. No, we're we're talking about what do, what does narrative mean? What does it mean to you? I mean, you are a writer, so I would expect that it means something very specific to you. But is that not true? Like you know, there's a question of like narrative versus story. You know what what is the difference between those two? And that's something that I've been thinking about. And I think you know, a story is a telling of certain things, and the narrative is more about how that story is put together. Okay, and if, from from a certain perspective, it's like you know, uh, I'm I'm sure there's uh, literature professors that want to tell me I'm wrong, and mm-hmm. semiotics people then who do philosophy of language will be like, no, 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 you totally misunderstand. And I'm like, that's fine, I can misunderstand, but uh, no, I, when I, when I think about narrative, I'm I'm thinking about not necessarily the plot points, but how the progression between plot points goes and is it a straight linear narrative or does it go forward in time or backwards in time you know are there flashbacks are we is the narrator reliable yes that's another good question is a the the narrator actually know what they're talking about or b are they actively trying to obscure the the facts to make themselves look better or you know, sometimes there's like competing narrators in a in a work and you get, you know, or like the whole Rashomon thing, you know, the, the one story told from four different perspectives. Oh, so yeah. We can nail a framework of what the story is, but how that's fleshed out and the nuances, different ways to make it more interesting can be uh, put in the narrative. What was that you were talking about with the four different perspectives? Um, it, it's this movie called Rashomon. I think it's a movie. And I think, you know, that's just like the archetype of first it goes from one character's point of view, then another, then another, then another. Yeah, yeah. And you kind of get a bigger picture. To me, when you said that, I thought of the Alexandria Quartet by Lawrence Durrell. Yeah, Alexandria yeah. Quartet. Yeah. Yeah, that's another another one of those. Yeah, right. The different novels for different perspectives. A lot of people use the term story and narrative interchangeably and don't really think about what the differences are. 
a narrative is told from the perspective of someone. That to me is the big difference. When you're talking story, it's something that anyone tells. You can tell the story of Dumbo. I can tell the story of Dumbo. But if we're talking about our individual tellings of the story of Dumbo, that is the narrative. Do you agree with that or is that too basic? I think you're getting out another another facet of it. Like sometimes certain works are called narratives because they are like the specific this person wrote this down and it was recorded like this person told the story and it was recorded like what there's like a genre of like true life writing from slaves in the 1800s they like they're like slave narratives and these are like historians and sociologists are looking at oh what was life like you get the authentic voice of the person right and you have to take into account that they are telling you from what their understanding is so you get a sort of purity of perspective but you there can be a whole lot of stuff that needs more explaining you know Right. So it's so it is like, like that's kind of what you're getting at with the whole idea of like, oh yeah, anybody can tell the story of ooh the fraught, confusing days of the 2000 election, but depending right. on who's telling the story, the narrative is going to be different. Correct. When you said perspective there, that's kind of what I was getting at. It's from the point of view of someone, whether they were involved or whether they were observing. The narrative is the additional perspective things that you put in mm-hmm. there. Do you think of anything in particular? Because for me, I, the first thing that popped into my head was a Christmas story. You've got the the narrator looking back at his uh, childhood ex- experiences, and uh, yeah, yeah, good old Gene Shepard telling you about how it was like being a kid in the fifties. Are you a fan of the Christmas Story movie? A Christmas the the Christmas Story movie. I sound like my A Christmas Story. The movie's called A Christmas Story. Yes, it's not called The Die Hard Dad. It's called die hard it's got yes it's got the guy from kolchak and, yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> peter and billingsley the, too or is that peter billingsley and it's it's got the the mom she was a mom on a different show too melinda was it, dylan was she was she the mom on the wonder years also or am i just mixing um, everything from the 80s into one thing i'm not sure in the 1990 Captain America, she was Mrs. Rogers. That's the one that starred a Rockefeller, right? No, it wasn't a Rockefeller. It was Matt Salinger. That's who it was. It was a Salinger. Anderson Cooper. He's a... No, he's a Vanderbilt. Jeez, I don't know. Yeah, J.D. Salinger's son mm. played Captain America in 1990 in a movie no one remembers. Exactly. No one remembers that movie. I think no one remembers it because it wasn't good. It could be. There are movies out there that are good that no one remembers. Do you think of anything other than uh, what I mentioned? I'm just looking at the Rotten Tomatoes on the 1990 Captain America movie. What does it say? 12, 12%. <laughs> just... Out of how many reviews? Oh, no. It was like, uh, the average rating is was 3.7 out of 10. I've I'm, been I'm looking at the Wikipedia. That's 3.7 out of 10 at that time because superhero stuff wasn't nearly as popular back then than it, than it is now but also it wasn't as well made the the tomato meter is 12 percent, 17 reviews yeah yeah audience score 19 percent out of ten thousand plus ratings yeah yikes you know i was reading superhero comics at the time and i feel like i knew i'd be disappointed or maybe i just didn't bother i don't know i was also Dependent on my parents to take me to the movies. Oh my gosh, she was also in Slapshot. Slapshot. I think that's a classic movie that not a lot of people remember, but... Oh my gosh, we're coming up on an anniversary, the anniversary of her death, too. Well, sorry for the downer. Well, it, it death happens, but the narrative. So I would imagine when you are writing, I mean, how do you refer to it? You're writing a novel. If I'm writing a novel, yeah. And the novel, it's story and narrative, or do you refer to the narrative in the story? Or like, how do you, when you're describing your writing? Oh, boy. When I'm describing my writing, it is um, a process. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Just the description. (laughs) It is a process. Yeah, well, well, there's lots of different kinds of writing, you know. you know, some of the writing I do, you know, the fiction stuff, it asks to be written according to the rules of narrative, but my little dictionary zine 
That's non-narrative writing, so it's not a story. It has its roots in your narrative. It does, actually. I do weave some of my personal stuff exactly. into that. So it's like you can find a narrative in it. And I think people like to make the connections between things and, and create narratives. Mm-hmm. Where maybe there aren't. One of the fascinating things for me is finding a thread that goes through different elements that might not seem obviously related. Uh-huh. That's for me as a, you know, an exciting form of narrative. It's hard for me to sit down and write a straightforward story beginning to end. I have to write it in little chunks. I'm like, oh, here's a little fascinating scene I thought of. And here's a fascinating thing. And here's a fast. And then I have all these little chunks and I got to figure out how to put them together in a way that makes sense. And I think that is a part of like putting it into a narrative. Like, you know, I've got all these little pieces I don't always know what the story is until I can take a look at all of them and then find that narrative thread that goes through them. And then I'm like, okay, this is how we form a story. So whereas like, you know, I kind of do look at narrative as being more nuanced than just the term story. I do think story depends on finding that narrative because, Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's sort of like the, the narratives is like the path through the story. The through line. Yeah, because the this, this story is like, here's a bunch of things that happened. And, you know, you can have your, like, high school, like, plot diagram with you got the, the expedition and the the, ex, the exposition. We are taking an expedition o- up a Mount plot diagram, right? You know, yeah. you got the exposition, the rising action, the climax, and the falling action, and the denouement. Or a resolution, depending on which high school teacher you had. I like denouement. Denouement. Le, the, the French. You use the Frenchy word to make it look like you went to college. Uh, or make, make it sound, it sound like fancy. Like. Yeah. I would like some escargot and give me a side of denouement. No, like, sorry, sorry. In this life, you cannot expect resolution. <laughs> just, so, like, that boring um, little high school plot diagram model. That's a simplification just for... for yeah, it's a it's, it's super simplification, but... It's how the parts are arranged is what... Exactly. You know? Yeah. All these things that have to be taken into account that shape the story, the narrative being different from the dialogue was something that we read in the definition, but... Oh, right, yeah, the, the dialogue... Yeah, yeah, but isn't that... I mean, how that information is delivered, the tone... I think the dialogue is part of the narrative. Yeah, Especially me too. like if you're looking at a format like a stage play or a, even a, like a, a film, you know, a lot of the information is delivered through the dialogue. Right. And the visuals, but... The narrator or whoever is telling the story from their perspective, their perception of what was said... I think it's one of those things where you, you've got a different perspective for each person who hears this person say something... Are any of those perceptions important to include in the narrative because it informs the story or informs where we are going in the story? Right. So like, is the fact that so-and-so makes a face that's very specific, is that going to help us understand why this character makes a decision that they make or so on? You know, Mm -hmm. there's so many parts to story other than the beginning, the middle, and the end. Oh, yeah. But you kind of need those three parts. Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah, you need those. I I was once accused of writing a story that had no middle. Oh. Because I just wrote a beginning and an end. It was fair criticism. It hurt my feelings at the time, but I was also a teenager. Can you summarize what it was? I mean, it's... Oh, I don't. It was some thing i wrote a long time ago i just but it was like trying to like write an adventure like detective story and a sci-fi thing and it was like four pages long and it didn't have a middle it was hmm. yeah and it was it was it was true and then and... did you understand what they were trying to say when they gave us critique of your work or oh oh yeah i it was not that i ever felt this person was wrong it mm-hmm. just i more felt like why can't i write a middle and <laughs> <laughs> same feeling for me with the endings it's like what's the point <laughs> that's kind of the thing i can do beginning really well and i can do middle really well but the, the... there are some stories that the ending is always a trick and uh, you know i read a lot of uh experimental fiction mm-hmm. 
Do I reel out of it? I don't know. I subscribe to that super uh, hipster magazine, McSweeney's. The literary magazine that Dave Eggers started way back. The guy that wrote the heartbreaking work of Staggering Genius. He's from the Midwest, but moved to San Francisco. He auditioned for season three of The Real World. Interesting. But they gave his spot to Judd Winnick. Judd, I tell you, man. I don't, you know, it's, yeah, it was, it's the right call. Uh, <laughs> the bicycle messenger. Give it to bi- the bicycle oh, messenger. Puck. Yeah, I remember Puck. He was gross. Anyway, we're talking about things that our entire audience of varying generations don't know. You guys got to go back and watch Real World 3. No. That was the last, the last real world that mattered. I think you can do without it. I think you can really just do without it. You could do without it, but absolutely don't go past Real World 3. If you want a stopping point. That basically destroyed television. They invented reality TV and... That's an interesting question, reality TV. Oh, reality TV. Yeah, it's a cheap way to generate television narrative. Yeah. You're just like, oh, let's just have a bunch of people do stuff and... Oh, oh, we'll create some manufactured incidents for them to get into. and The editing becomes the process by which the narrative is told, right? Exactly. I mean, especially yeah. when you're filming them all day, it's like, well, which parts do we include? And that's very important if you want to tell a story from your perspective. Yeah. Whether it's true or not is another thing, right? Oh, truth. You, you, Whoa. Well, that's a I different mean, episode. Yeah. It's a, no. it's, <laughs> The editing process, as a writer, you need to figure out which parts are the important parts in the story that you're trying to tell or you want Mm -hmm. to tell with reality TV. It's not like C-SPAN, where it's exactly what's going on. Those reality shows, it's edited. And you got to realize that they're editing it to tell a specific story from their perspective. They're they're finding the story and then... There are scenarios that are kind of set up. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of those things. I mean, whether they're set up or not, I don't think is the point. If they're acted, I think that's kind of like cheapening the whole, you're pretending. If there's a pretending sort of component or you can tell someone's pretending. Yeah. The thing that you put in their path, the manufactured thing that's going to make conflict in the show, like kicking out the bicycle messenger because whatever. Because he's gross? Yeah, yeah I don't know what he's he gross. Did. I don't remember what he did. Oh, he said he something. He his boogers? No. No, no. <laughs> did he say something mean to Pedro? Yep. Yep, that was that was it. And everyone loves yeah, was everyone it. loves Pedro. Yeah. But, oh, Jesus, back on the, we're back on the, I mean, basically, I'm almost embarrassed to know that I remember that. But anyway, so so what I'm saying. I mean, yeah, I kind of remember that, yeah. I'm not a fan of reality television. If I want to experience life I experience life. Why would I want to see other people experience life? It's a lot of it. I just find really boring or like the bachelorette. Oh yeah. That's can't watch those shows, but I don't think those are real. You like the British baking show though, right? That's a baking show. It's more like a game show than a reality show. No, it's not a game show. It's a contest show. Okay. okay. I, and I think, and that's the thing. It's like, it's a contest and it's got a format and they're like, oh, try, you know, they're, they're challenged to make certain things and you get to know the people a little bit. Well, you get to know the people for what they show you. For what they show. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But of course they're going to, they show you the nice stuff. Yeah. And then Noel Fielding is just wandering around saying bad shit stuff all the time. Yeah. I love Noel Fielding. I think um, somebody, a family friend, I'm slowing down the na- narrative. No, I, I know somebody who uh, lives in the UK and uh, she knows somebody who was sort of adjacent to the Great British break- Baking Show and oh, okay. Uh, okay. knew about that. There was There are certain wranglers that are just there to, to sort of keep Noel Fielding on track. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cause it, just because I mean, because he's a funny guy, right? Right. You mean just <laughs> just just focus him on something just to, focus, to keep yeah, him I think focused, ke- right? Keep him keep him from like wandering off or going just too nuts and jumping up on tables or something, right? 
I don't know. He's a wild and crazy guy. So they're they're trying to control the narrative. <laughs> they're trying to con- they're just trying to control Noel. Like, the, yeah, okay. <laughs> the narrative. There's the narrative. There's not. Well, that's the thing. It's a contest. It's not necessarily. It's like a, you know, like a a football game. What's the narrative? Uh, yeah. They're they're trying to do the sports better than the other team. So <laughs> it's <laughs> they're trying to kick a touchdown. They, they're trying to yeah. Like so it's so so there's it's not so much about you know, story arc other than like looking at people's individual performance. So Mm. yeah. So I don't, in my mind, there's not a very like strong narrative in in that kind of like contest show. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to call them contest. There's reality shows and then there's contest shows. And then there's, I mean, the contest amazing race. I don't know. I kind of agree with you. The contest shows like you've got your, Project Runway or whatever. Project Runway, yeah. Or, or yeah, anything where it. you have two people working together or anything like that. There is yeah. that added dimension where it's, you know, it, yeah, it is a contest show at the end of the day, but there is drama going on and there, there are stories some drama. that are being told. Yeah, I think the, the Project Runway is there's a little bit more stress going on. The Great British Bake Off, at least that show... It's like this kind of thing where like they they go to this tent in a nice uh, countryside setting mm-hmm. for like a series of like nine weekends or however long it is. They're not living it every day, except for there was one they did a COVID series that like they're all quarantined. And right. So they did kind of just run through it all real fast. But the one girl didn't bring enough clothes because she thought she was going to go home the first day. But. <laughs> <laughs> so she kept wearing the same outfit over and over again. But, it's like, I thought I was going to be kicked off this thing. Yeah, <laughs> like no way I was going to make it to four episodes. But but lo and behold. So I mean, there are little narratives. There are you know there are little stories within it all. But but the overarching is the person winning the game or winning the contest, yeah. and then it's more about watching the process. Than, yeah. But then you sort of review that process and it's like, well, how did this person, the decisions they made, were they intentional? Were they not intentional? Like your Amazing Race stuff too. I think that's... Definitely. There's more narrative built into that one. Oh yeah. Like because they have to go different places and they have their roadblocks and they're... I haven't watched The Amazing Race in 15 years, but apparently it's still on. Yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) I'm going to ask you this question. Would you go on the Amazing Race with your daughter? <laughs> um, ooh, if she wanted to go on the Amazing Race, wow, we'd like trade off having panic attacks. It would be great. <laughs> <laughs> the drama is part of what makes good television, I guess. But no, yeah, I mean, I would. At least the the person I am now, I actually probably would go on the Amazing Race if. But um, back how many years ago, you think? Oh, I went, when I was watching it on TV and I was just like crippled by anxiety. And Yeah, that's, that's yeah. a no-go then. But, but now you think that you would be up for the task? I think I would make it an episode. Yeah. <laughs> Whether or not you make it an episode, I think, you know, that, yeah. that's one of those things where there's timing questions and so on and so forth. It's just basically, would you consider doing it? And I would consider doing it if... Like, let's say if Star was like, Dad, we got to do the Amazing Race. Right. Because, you know, there's like an application process and, you know, yeah. That's probably not worth all the hassle. But I mean, if it was like, if I could just snap my fingers and you're on the Amazing Race, would that be something that you wanted? I mean, I think there's a lot to learn. I think I'm I'm at a phase of my life where I'm going to say yes to fantastic opportunities okay so, that, so that's yeah it, to me it would be about experiencing new things you're right experiencing new things yeah and it wouldn't be about all that drama maybe i would be a good contestant but i don't want drama so when drama occurs mm-hmm. needless drama i just ignore it yeah i mean i'm like honestly i think i would rather just like go on my own trip yeah yeah you can make yeah. your own you know, you could do. Your I mean, own like I'm thinking of. about, like realistically, like knowing my own energy. Like, I, I, when I travel, I often need to have a nap in the afternoon. <laughs> that right. might not work right. well with the Amazing Race. Right. <laughs> like, like, yeah, we lost, we didn't make it the first day because I had to take a nap. Yes. <laughs> I conked out in a taxi on my way over here. But hey, if CBS wanted to pay me to go to 
a couple of countries to watch me take a nap. I would do it. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> Napping around the world. Anyway, back to narrative. Narrative design. Narrative design in video games? Yep. Recently, I applied for a job. Truth be told, I probably was underqualified for on paper, but abundantly qualified for in the minutia of <laughs> what's between. There's something about lived experience that we got to figure out how to show people what we know. That... that being said, this job was for narrative design and video games. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was expressed is how story differs from narrative or narrative design. There is a language barrier also, or not barrier, it was just, you know, their nuances, their differences. As, as I recall, this company was not based in the United States. No, it was not. But it's just what got me thinking about this whole story versus narrative thing. Essentially, I was right. uh, trying to apply for that job and getting denied. Uh, <laughs> not bitter, not bitter. Yeah, uh, you, you got to try, Ben. You got to like, you got to push yourself. Yeah, that's true. You never know. Until you try. And if there's another opportunity doing that, I'll do it again. But that's not the point here. We're not talking about my narrative. We're talking about video game narrative. Yeah. I, I remember this process. You were talking about it, explaining the, the thing. And that it really got me started to think about the difference between narrative and story. And I was like, yeah, this is fascinating. And cause so carry on. Yeah. So I can relate one of my favorite video game story that's made up of five different narratives that intersect mm -hmm. this game called Odin Sphere. It was originally on the PlayStation 2, but what they wanted to make the game kind of exceeded the capabilities of the PlayStation 2, so they had to cut it down significantly so it could be released. And there were a couple of design choices that were made that weren't optimal to make the game flow the way it should it was like during battles where you were shooting or attacking or whatever you'd have to press a trigger to pull up a wheel that you would select something on essentially a pause but that completely ruined i mean it was fun still but it kind of since i wanted to do mostly action i just used my items less yeah right because i couldn't do it real time i had to pause it every time i wanted to use an item or whatever and i don't think i finished that version well then there was i guess remaster remake this company that made this is vanillaware they've got this really distinctive art style for their games that they say hand painted characters and backgrounds Odin Sphere Leaferseer, which was released for the PlayStation 3, the PlayStation 4, and the PlayStation Vita in 2016. When it went on sale for the PlayStation 4, I bought it and played all the way through it. And it's got an interesting full story about Ragnarok. There are five different characters, and they play out the story across those characters five different narratives but then there's a final sort of confrontation type thing that's a sixth story but it all revolves around the narratives of these five different characters they go through their different story arcs themselves but they cross paths with the other characters and it has you play these characters in a specific order you know you can't choose which character you want to play I think what they were trying to do is make the story make more sense, but it does bounce around because it starts out with your first character that you play. She is a Valkyrie, and one of her Valkyrie sisters dies and gives her her scepter. She's so saddened by the whole thing that she tries to kill herself by attacking someone who's really powerful or whatever. Oh, uh, yeah. Who, spoiler alert, she later falls in love with. But I mean, I don't know. What? It's just interesting watching the different characters, the way that they interact in these crossing pieces, but you don't know it until you get to the part where you play. You don't know the full story. It just kind of, mm -hmm. the way that it reveals the story through these different characters' interaction. And of course, it's a game, right? So you have to go through this side-scrolling shooter-ish kind of thing where you've got different powers each character has a very distinct set of moves that can do different things. So they not only do they traverse the environment differently, but they also can access specific points. You've got different approaches to the same boss 
characters because they mm. have their different move sets and the way that they function so much more developed and fleshed out than originally and it's just such a wonderful way i thought to tell a story through these interlaced storylines that lead to a conclusion where you have to pick an order and that order determines the end of the story. Like you've got five different characters and you play different mini levels for each one of those characters in a specific order. And that order that you play them in kind of determines what the ending is. And if you do them in a specific order, that's quote unquote, the true ending based on clues that they give you throughout the game you get the best possible ending where everyone is happy. And this company, Vanillaware, is coming out with a new game that appears to be sort of more of a turn-based or real-time strategy kind of game. Sometimes they look to be one or the other, but you know you can't really tell by the graphics. The name of the game, and it's supposed to be coming out March 8th, so not too much uh, longer here. Unicorn Overlord. Unicorn Overlord. Oh. I don't think there are any things where you're running a kingdom of unicorns or anything. It just That's just the name of the game is Unicorn Overlord. The game that they came out with before that was 13 Sentinels, where you have 13 different characters that you interact with. And it tries to weave all of those stories together. But trying to have a narrative that (laughs) involves 13 different characters is pretty ridiculous and confusing. It's it's tricky. I mean, even five seemed like it was going to be too much, but then it was just enough, I thought, for me personally. You play through each character sequentially, so you just, you know, open another window to the story each time you advanced. And you would fight and defeat the same boss enemies as a part of telling the story. But it was done in such a way that each path through the story involved going to different areas of the map. It wasn't like you were doing exactly the same things. Mm. The maps were the same, but the path you traveled was different depending on your character. That is an interesting way to tell a story. What do you think of the graphics? For Odin Sphere? Yeah. Then I looked at the Unicorn Overlord, and then I was like, hey, I remember that lately I saw a AI art fail of an old man hugging a unicorn. It was hilarious. <laughs> Did you see that? Uh, no. The old man no, hugging a unicorn. Want- well, I sent you a link. You can look at it later, but you can see you can see that the old man is not hugging in the right place. Oh. He's hugging in a place that would make him very dead. <laughs> and we go back to the, you know, how much does an AI really understand of the way the world works and the way physics are? The way I mean, unicorns work. Well, I mean, yeah, we, with the way unicorns work, but I mean, that's something that you could describe to a human. So how do you describe it to a computer? They are like a horse, but they have a big pointy horn. Yeah, no, I mean, he nailed it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't work like that. <laughs> I mean, yep, that's it's right through his head. <laughs> he's, he's just kebab. It could be one of those Steve Martin things. Could be one of the... Yeah, the old Steve Martin arrow uh, through his head thing. The arrow you know? through his head. Is the unicorn horn through his head? Yeah. That is uh, either a very, very uh, disturbing growth on that man's head or... The unicorn didn't want to be hugged. Yeah. <laughs> Although there's no blood going on, so... No. Maybe the AI figured it's something that doesn't exist. Maybe. Or maybe like the AI totally understands how unicorns work. They just don't understand how people's heads do. <laughs> <laughs> which is not a good sign for us not a it's good not sign. A, not a good sign i i decided i'm just gonna stop worrying about it so much okay i'm not gonna worry about the ais if they if they inherited the earth they inherit the earth you know right i mean i'm thinking i'm gonna just uh try to be a decent steward of my little plot of ground and do you have any video game 
narratives? Yeah, the answer is no, probably. No, no, Pitfall. That was a great narrative in that. You jump over stuff. It's like an Indiana Jones guy. His name's Harry Pitfall, and he falls into pits. But he's not Harry. Yeah, he just jumped over stuff. Sometimes logs would be rolling through the jungle for no reason. Gotta jump over those. Scorpions, yeah. too. There were scorpions. Scorpions, gotta jump over those. And then there were, like, crocodiles. If you jumped right on the, the right part of their heads, you could stand on them. Right. But if you jumped into their mouth, you're dead. And their mouths would open and close. When they're closed, you could walk on their snout area. And then there were fires just randomly in there, too. Yeah, the whole thing didn't make any sense. Yeah. For the time, it it looked cooler than a lot of Atari games. Oh, yeah. But- that was one of the things that Activision excelled at. A lot of the designers of those Activision games used to work at Atari and then they left and they started Activision to work. Yeah. But they had some really interesting, unique ideas. And I think maybe this is just speculation. Maybe they left because they wanted to try to make these creative games and Atari wanted to stick more to a formula for making money. Which didn't yeah. seem, didn't really work with ET, but oh no, no, I no, didn't. That was I didn't mention terrible. that on the ET twenty six the Atari twenty six hundred game, which is no, not that's not yeah. nearly as horrible as a lot of people think, but it is more annoying it was, than it is horrible. It's a very annoying game, yeah. yeah. But speaking of Atari and and narrative, there was a slew of games that came out and. They would come with a little mini comic book in them. Oh, yeah. About the Atari Force. And I think that was just a way to try to get you to buy more of the video games so you could read the comic book. The Atari Force comic book? The Atari Force comic. You got to find out about what the Atari Force is doing. Like, Yeah. Yeah, it, it was kind of cool. I think Marvel actually was involved in Atari Force. There was also like a newsstand comic book, I think, in addition to the little um, the little minis that came with the games. It wasn't Marvel. It was DC. DC? DC was... That makes sense. Atari Force. You know, okay, so now that you brought up Marvel and DC. Yeah. And comics, because I brought up comics, because that's what... That's that's my main nerd pa- passion. Mm-hmm. But, um... DC and Marvel Comics, the big powerhouses of the superhero genre, they have two different styles for coming up with stories. Now, it, it's probably different now, but especially um, in the 1960s, like when Stan Lee was turning Marvel around and because it was failing at whatever it was doing before. And so... He's like, all right, let's make some superheroes. But he uh, created this writing style for the comic books called the Marvel Method. Okay. And DC would do a full script method where the writer would write out a full script with panel breakdowns and what the dialogue was going to be. And Stan Lee would basically write up like a one page plot synopsis of what was supposed to happen in the thing and hand that to the artist who would go and draw out 20 pages of comics Mm -hmm. to go with the plot thing. And then Stanley would go in and decide what word balloons were supposed to go on what page. Right. And and so it could be a very collaborative process with the writer, or you get some really weird shoehorned thought balloons to explain why somebody's (laughs) doing a really weird thing. (laughs) How long was this? During what time period again? I don't don't know... um, if they ever stopped. I can't see the Marvel method working for the way Bettis does his stuff. Oh, oh, uh, Brian Michael Bendis? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, no, he probably doesn't do it that way. He probably writes it out full script. And I think the thing is, uh, it worked really well for like Frank Miller mm-hmm. because he would write and draw his own stuff. Right. You know? Yeah, it's a, a different kind of thing. Yeah. So, so there are like few like writer artists. Mm hmm. They could handle their own things. And then some of the the writers would work really closely with certain artists. But um, it became like a bone of contention with certain, um, you know, Jack Kirby would be like, hey, you know, Stan Lee gets all the credit for creating the X-Men and the Avengers and all this. But I did a lot of work on that, too. I actually created the stories like Stan Lee would give me a you know, five paragraph essay. And I'd be like, well, let's turn it into this awesome, cool thing. Yeah. You know, so there was authors and and artists and stuff bounced between the, the big two, as it were that, because I remember the original artist for the alpha flight comics. uh He went over to DC and did Superman. John Byrne. And he was like, um, 
Oh, yeah. Well, when John Byrne's run on Superman was he wrote it and drew it. Yeah. So his Marvel stuff, he collaborated with Chris Claremont a lot. Okay. And, and it, uh, a lot of their, like, X-Men stuff, it would be, like, story by Chris Claremont and John Byrne, and then, then they would break it down to between words and pencils. Right. So I think depending on which book it was, there might have been closer, more cordial collaboration between the the writer and the penciler. Mm. And, you know, then the tracer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. The ink. I mean, because like the, the Marvel method was all about let's create an assembly line thing where we can just crank out more comics faster. Yeah. And so like Stanley came up with it because he was writing so many things about the like i can't write a full script every time and so he'd come up with a synopsis hand it off to the guy who did the pencils and you're like yeah that looks good this is what the letters are going to be the letter goes and puts the words on yeah and then the, the tracer goes and puts the ink on top of the pencils and, right and then the intern erases everything pardon me if i'm wrong i think i think they're actually the inker the inker they're the inker yes i don't want to belittle the inkers actually because some of them are really great oh yeah yeah. yeah and like you could see it like some comics you could see like oh the main anchor like got overwhelmed so they had someone else fill in on a couple of pages and you go like Whew, glad that wasn't the front page because it doesn't quite pop as much as uh like terry austin's inks really popped i'm not nearly as focused on the nuts and bolts of the way comics were designed and stuff i was more focused on the story personally oh yeah no and, and narratives right but but i mean how you tell those stories and then how you develop your characters and right you know and see the what what i got really interested in was the more independent comics where like the artist and the writer were doing you know they were the same person you know that that's a kind of narrative that i kind of like because part of my brain you know i still make comics mm. and the, my brain works kind of better if i can like work on visuals and then work on, Oh, what words go with that? And then yeah, they, the kind of two parts of my brain play with each other through the, the process, through the creative process. Yeah. Yeah. There's different thought processes, different creative processes. Yeah. Uh, you can't help but think that if you're the writer, you're telling your story. If mm -hmm. someone was writing a screenplay from that thing, yeah, they're telling a different story. If someone is drawing and, writing it's going to be different than someone who's writing it and then passing it off to someone who's drawing and then passing it off i mean you yeah know, obviously now uh, it's not yeah. just about the ink and things it's about the stuff that you want to convey the specifics of the story that you think are important right will determine how you're going to draw that thing out or ink it out or whatever or or how are you gonna you know map out how the video game progresses around these you know, story items, you know? Yeah. I don't know what the right word is. Story items, plot points. I don't know. Story components. I would yeah. call story elements, I guess. Story elements. That's the word I meant. Yeah. Items. Jeez. Story items. <laughs> story items. What is that? That's something. You, yeah. Never mind. Story elements. Or narrative elements. So you can sound fancy. But I mean, I call there, it fancy. Th the way you tell stories in video games can also be told through the way you control a character or how mm -hmm. you enter. You know what I mean? The, there are things that you can do in a video game that you can't necessarily do in either a book, television, or movie. Mm -hmm. You know, the one thing that I think of is the Batman Arkham Asylum games. Mm. They were really fun to play. They were complex enough to where you could string all different Batman's moves together. They had a, his detective vision. You were solving things. You were solving puzzles, which kind of mm -hmm. goes back to the detective comics, I think. Right. Yeah. But one of the cool things during the game, something happens, you get captured by, who's it? The Scarecrow. And the whole game blanks and it looks like it's rebooting and you're starting over again. All right. Then you do that and something, it's like the scarecrow's fear realm or, or whatever is happening. Making those decisions in games, those are specific to games, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're interacting as a part of that. Do we do just a cutscene here or do we have someone interact? Some games where it's like, 
you're walking. <laughs> yeah. It's like, why are you making me walk? Why are you walking? Boring. I'm not doing anything. You could just make this a cutscene, and then I can walk the cutscene. <laughs> why are you making me walk from point A to point B yeah. in the story? It doesn't feel, one, it, it's not fun, and two, it doesn't feel like it's doing anything. Yeah, right. Yeah, is anything happening while you're walking? Yeah. Mm, I mean, you're if, if, hearing stuff, you're looking around, okay, but... yeah. Anyway, we can, can we talk walk about faster. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you're a naked bloated body in this game I'm playing right now. So we'll we'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a game that I tried to get through it. I've figured some things out with some of the game mechanics where there are certain things that you have a limited number of and I mistakenly burn through all of those Uh-oh. things so i've got to start over again which is no problem on a couple of games it's just not the right time for me to play the game too and i put them yeah, down sometimes yeah you got- let it sit for a little while and then come back to it and then have a fresh perspective so andrew to complete the episode to the cherry on top of the episode if you will last thoughts on the word narrative I feel like a a narrative is a way to find your way through a story. Mm -hmm. It is part of the adventure. Like the story might be the skeleton of what happens, but the narrative is like, which paths do we take to get there? You know, where all of the exploration of the characters, the settings, the things happen. You can tell the story by saying I drove through Maine, but the narrative of driving through Maine is going to be different. Yeah. I don't know why I picked, why did I pick Maine? Why did you driving through Maine? <laughs> hey, you know, you just got to thank me for not talking about James Joyce's Ulysses. Oh, you're, yeah. There yeah, are some narrative choices made there. That's a big <laughs> fat book I read and I'm proud of myself for reading it. And one day I'll read it again. I have a final thought on the word narrative, and that is, okay. like I've told you before, I don't like talking politics on this show wherever possible. I, I, I can talk magnets, but not politics. Yeah, <laughs> Magnets are fine. Water's fine. Magnets are fine. South Korean fried toothpicks, totally okay. That's, that's not really political. It's more like, what? This is sort of along the lines of the difference between narrative and the story. The story is the thing. It is static. It is what it is, right? Yeah. It is the things that happened specifically, what happened, and then the narrative is how the thing is perceived and Mm -hmm. how that is delivered to people. And that is, you know, why people say things like they're changing the narrative or altering the narrative. Altering the narrative. We're like changing our focus about what parts of the story we're telling right yeah. selectively yeah. including or omitting based on what story that you want to tell exactly or how you want the story to be perceived a now, great example i saw this was, oh you, if several years ago it was like a, a re-edit of a trailer for the movie the shining oh yeah they just called it shining and like picked scenes to make it look like a happy feel good family movie yeah. It's like, you can pick those parts out of that story. <laughs> right. Uh, my friend Ryan, the movie Better Off Dead, he did a oh, yeah. a remix trailer of Better Off Dead to make it into a thriller. <laughs> <laughs> I want my $2. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all the stuff about him, you know, killing himself and and all that stuff, it blended really well. But anyway, it was a really good job. I'll send it to you yeah. one of these days. So. Okay. But yeah, so see, anyway. that's that's... An example of what we can do. Yeah, yeah. It's, we can change the narrative. Change the perception based on omitting or including mm-hmm. things within. Yeah, exactly. You know, which is something that the news is not supposed to do, but I think the news has a tendency to do. They do, yeah. I mean, on one, on the one hand, it's like they only have a, so much time to get things in, but then on the other hand, some outlets seem to have an agenda. Oh yeah, definitely. Sometimes that agenda is clicks. In, in yeah, oh yeah, age. just getting more and more viewers, more eyes on it. Yeah, like what is it? William Randolph Hearst said, you know, before the Spanish-American War, he's like, "You give me the pictures, and I'll get you the war." Yeah, 
Yeah. You know, like he knew that a war would sell newspapers, so he's like, "Yeah, let's make it happen." Like, yep. I'm not saying he started the Spanish American War. I'm, he probably just knew that by the time the pictures come back, there would be right a war going on. It was one of those decisions that was a risky decision, but the likelihood, right? It's like you take yeah. a, take a risk, and it panned out for him. Right. right. On that note, Andrew. Thank you for joining me on this week's episode of the Too Vague Podcast. I really appreciate you and your storytelling ability. And your- my storytelling, my ability to uh, stray far and wide from the main narrative thread. <laughs> Which is kind of, this is the show. Boy, I don't envy your job of editing, but <laughs> I, I like the results. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. And then when we have your daughter on the show later this week. And we have to change the name of the podcast. Oh, yeah? Yeah. To the... Too Vague and a Baby? What? <laughs> no. I was going to say your last name, but Too Vague and a Baby is much better. Too Vague and a Baby. <laughs> I don't know if we could get Steve Gutenberg out of retirement here, but whatever. Get the Gutenberg out don't of Don't find the- Gutenberg. Yeah, that's the one we need. Forget about Selleck and dancing. We need the Gutenberg. We need the Gutenberg. But anyway. All right. <laughs> Thank you, audience, for joining us on this week's episode. My name is Ben. My name's Andrew. And we've been your hosts. Have a wonderful night. Bye. Bye.